Good morning and thank you again for joining us on our journey of adventure through the Bible as we look at those defining statements or defining incidents that impact our lives. Yesterday we saw that the Israelites under Joshua began to take possession of the land of Canaan. Their first big cities they overthrew was Jericho and then Ai. Then they had a big battle at a place called Gibeon where God made the sun stand still so the battle could be completed. They then began to take uh, the southern cities and then the northern cities of the land of Canaan. Now before I go any further, you might ask the question, is it not unfair that God allows the Israelites to dispossess a people of their own land of Canaan? And I want to say that land and judgment are connected. God knows all things. And he judges nations for gross sins like idolatry, immorality, child sacrifice, barbarity, and savagery. And so in a sense, he judges the land of Canaan for those sins and allows the people in whom and through whom he's working, the Israelites, to possess that land. Now, Israel, Israel was not without sin, and in their history, when they turned their backs on God and worshipped idols, they lost their land. And in fact, the most recent one is the fact that in AD 70, when they had turned their back on the Messiah, they then spent the next 1900 years dispossessed of their land and only returned in 1948. So God was fair in that land is connected with faithfulness to him. The Jewish nation, the Israelite nation, was a work in progress at that time. Now, as we move back into the story, um, Joshua then has to, once the Israelites have taken possession of most of the land, he then allocates the land to the various tribes. Two tribes are given the land east of the Jordan, which they chose, and the other remaining ten tribes get the whole land of Canaan. Um, and now the book finishes with Joshua in his old age, giving a last challenge and a call to the Israelites. Uh, he runs through the history of what God has done, starting from Abraham all the way to the present. But I want to read this challenge that he does give them, which applies to all of us. Joshua 24, verses 14 to 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The defining statement is that last line, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's what's referred to as drawing a line in the sand. In effect, he's saying, I don't know what you're going to do, but as for me and my household, this is what we are going to do. We're not dependent on your decision. We've made up our minds, and my position, he would say, is unalterable. I will follow the Lord from now on. And you see, we all have to do this at some time in our lives. We have to make that unalterable, life-changing decision to follow Christ. I say unalterable because we need to make it sincerely by faith. When we do so and make the call to follow him, no matter what lies ahead, God takes us and holds us firm in his grip. It's a faith commitment. It's a start of a new relationship. And it cannot be taken from us, says Scripture. Nothing in heaven or on earth can separate us from his love, from his grip, says Romans 8. And there's a powerful uh, spiritual song that's very old that has the chorus, Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. It's that sort of commitment, that, that decision we make that says, I'm going to follow him 
no matter what. And Joshua drew uh, the line in the sand that day for him and his family. When I became a believer, that became my mantra as a young Christian. And when I got married, I put that statement on the wedding order of service. And Brenda and I promised by doing that, that our family would always honor God. And that commitment takes time and energy, a commitment to to pray for your family as they grow up, to read them the Bible, to ensure they're going to church, to encourage them in, to attend the youth and the young adults, to always remember that we are modeling for them. And we don't always get it right. I accept that. But the commitment, the effort must be there to invest in our families, in their spirituality. And even when they have grown up and left the family home, then parents need to make the commitment to pray for them, for their physical safety, but more than that, for their spiritual growth, that we won't stop praying. Of our three children, all of them, when they were old enough and ready to get married, uh, their husbands and wives respectfully, uh, respectively all made the commitment and wrote on their wedding orders of service the statement, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You see, you can't do it on your own. And there are times when we perhaps drift away from God and we have to redraw that line in the sand as a family or on specific issues. And we say, now this is what we've got to do now. We must stop doing what we've been doing and we will follow God from now on. It's not our own ability. It's God's faithfulness. We will need to rely on God's strength when we make that commitment and to follow through on that commitment every single day. But when you make that decision and that leap of faith, God sees the intention of your heart and he claims you as his own and he promises you his strength. All he requires is that decision, that commitment, when you decide to draw the line in the sand. Let us pray. God, help us to commit ourselves to honor you always. Forgive us then when we drift away from that commitment. Help us even today to renew it and say, I will follow you. No turning back. No turning back. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. God bless you until tomorrow. <laughs>